This video is brought to you by my supporters on Patreon, Buy Me Coffee, and YouTube. If you'd like to support me, you can find the links below. This is the podcast with Dr. Rohan Francis, who is a medical YouTuber from the UK. And I've greatly admired his channel from day one. And I've been wanting to get him on a podcast for a long time. And I'm glad I finally got the chance. Now, he's also extremely vocal against alternative medicine. So we spoke about that. We spoke about science communication. We spoke about being a YouTuber and a lot of other stuff. I got to learn a lot. I really enjoyed the conversation. And I hope you do too. My name's Pranav. You're watching the Sciences 2 podcast. Enjoy. All right, what is up, people? Uh, Science is Dope podcast uh, edition two. And I've got with me over here Dr. Rohan Francis, who has agreed to come all the way to all the way from London over here just, just for, for doing this, this just podcast. For this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, now nah, he's actually just visiting. Uh, so I managed to grab him here. He gave us time. Thank you uh, for oh, giving, thanks for the invite coming for to the podcast and uh, yeah. And uh, Doctor Rohan is uh, in case you haven't watched my uh, Ayush video. He was there uh, in the video. But uh, for those uh, who don't know him, which is very unlikely thing, uh, why don't you introduce yourself, Doctor? Sure. Um, well, I'm uh, a cardiologist from the UK and um, I got a YouTube channel called Medlife Crisis where I talk about um, you know, medical science, but, you know, from a, maybe a perspective of trying to analyze things rather than more just straight medical education. Okay. Um, and I think that's where we kind of have a bit of common ground and where mm -hmm. we've become friends sort of talking about similar, similar kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And um, then, you know, I've got a particular interest as well, because I'm uh, originally from India, was born here and, and moved to the UK when I was young and uh, still, you know, come back regularly. So I try and stay in touch a little uh, with, with um, what's going on with science in India, although I think I am very out of touch and hopefully you can fill me in a bit today. Some people watching would call me out of touch, but uh, yeah. Well, let's... we're all out of touch with some with something, so you, you can't be <laughs> up to date with everything. So I want to talk about uh, this. See, I have no background in medicine, uh, but medicine is something that really fascinates me. And uh, one reason for this is Dr. House MD. Are you right. familiar with the... Of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, so when I was in college uh, doing my engineering, the whole time I was regretting doing engineering instead of medicine because of the show. And I've probably seen all eight seasons, um, all the episodes at least thrice. So, um, yeah, what do you think of the show? Well, you'll be pleased, I guess, then, uh, if you were feeling... <laughs> concerned that you'd chosen the wrong path, you'd be pleased when I tell you that real medicine is absolutely nothing like house. It is completely unrealistic in many ways. It's still very entertaining. I also used to enjoy watching it a lot. I think the first five series, then it mm. started going a little off the boil. But um, it started when I was at medical school and I would kid myself that it was like one hour of studying. I said, ah, oh, well, you know, I'll watch house. Then I've done one hour of work today. Um, and then when I learned a bit more medicine, I realized that's complete rubbish because I had to unlearn the things that House taught me because it was uh, so inaccurate. But um, uh, yeah, t medical TV, I try not to, to watch too much, but uh, the, um, I think for me, the, the top draw is ER from okay. the 90s, the first few series of ER that made George Clooney a star and I everything. No, this is going so back. It, it, it was legendary in terms of TV. It changed all of TV. Oh. But don't get me started on that because I'll, I'll talk for an hour on ER and Scrubs. They're okay. the two most accurate and, and, and best, I'd Isn't say. Isn't Scrubs more comedy than drama? Exactly. So people always are always concerned when I say that it's, uh, it's accurate. But it, I think not necessarily the medicine, but it really captured the kind of camaraderie and, and, mm. and fun that medicine can be, mm. particularly in those sort of early years of your career. So, so Scrubs is, is very dear to a lot of doctors' hearts, I think. Okay. Um, and House, 
yeah, is is kind of more more just entertainment. So I I know some elements of the show were dramatized and uh, were made to look more dramatic than they actually are. But medical accuracy wise, would you say it's bad? F. Yeah, I'd say it's a fail, complete fail. Crap. <laughs> um, a lot of the episodes of House, mm-hmm. you know, it'll go for one hour of all these different things. They'll finally come to the diagnosis, and then any doctors watching will be like, they, they would have got that on the first first blood test. Like, why? Why is it taking them one hour? You know, they have to go to people's houses and break in and yeah. look through their fridge. And <laughs> the same team does all the tests. House's team does everything. There's nobody else in the hospital that does anything. So they do the surgery, they do the radiology, they do the looking down the microscope, they do everything. It's, uh, it's, uh, but it, you know, it was fun. It was fun. It definitely, and Hugh Laurie is, I'm a huge fan of Hugh Laurie. Yeah. He's a, yeah. such a fantastic actor. But uh, no, accuracy, very bad. Okay, okay, <laughs> interesting. Um, so have you personally uh, had cases in your practice uh, that are, that were kind of really difficult to diagnose or something where you had to go through a lot of twists and turns before you finally arrived at you know the course of action you should go the go with sure i mean you know that's that's one of the appealing things about medicine and so I started as a, as a surgeon. I, I, went, I went down the surgical route initially. I wanted to be a cardiac surgeon. And one of the things that put me off surgery, and for those who aren't aware, the kind of big divide in medicine is, I mean, you've obviously got hospital doctors and, and general practitioners, so that's one division. But within hospital practitioners, you've got medical doctors versus surgical doctors. Surgeons, I think everybody knows what a surgeon is. And Physicians, what we sometimes refer to as the medical doctors, are the ones who do the diagnosing. Um, and cardiologists are kind of halfway between because I do still do operations, um, sort of procedures and things, but uh, we also do the, the diagnostic side as well. And I felt like that was missing from the surgical aspect. I, I, mm. I really enjoyed that challenge of trying to reach a diagnosis. Having said that, it's definitely not like House in that most people. Common, pe- common things are common. That's one of the sayings we have in medicine. So every time, you know, particularly if you've been watching a lot of house and you're a new doctor, somebody comes in with a bit of a fever and they go, ah, could this be Rocky Mountain <laughs> spotted fever? I said, no, it's probably just the flu. You know, so um, you start looking for really kind of weird things. You don't find them very, very frequently. Um, and another expression we have is uh, if you hear hoofbeats, it's horses, not that's zebras. That's a line from the first episode. Yeah, of I mean, it's, I think it's been in Scrubs as well. Um, so that's a, a famous line. Um, so it's very tempting to want to go down these exciting little avenues. And there are some fields of medicine where you do that more frequently. So a lot of the time when we have difficulty diagnosing something, we'll refer to the rheumatologists um, or infectious disease mm. specialists who, mm. who, who are very good at finding these difficult uh, diseases. House's department was the Department of Diagnostic Di- Medicine. There's which, no which, which doesn't exist, but, but it sounds very exciting. Um, but in cardiology, less frequently, you know, most of the time I'm, I'm diagnosing straightforward stuff. But yeah, I've had a few cases where I've been very proud that I've come to a diagnosis that um, other people haven't spotted. My, probably my best one was something called yellow nail syndrome, because I'd just been doing my postgraduate exams, like, like the board exams. So it was all fresh in my mind. And there was a patient who'd been coming for many years and nobody had diagnosed it. And I was like, ah, wait, is this? And then, you know, and it turned out that was the case. So I was very proud of myself then. But um, those are few and far between. Uh, by the way, uh, for those who want to know, that line is, if you hear hoof beats, think horses, not zebras, right? Uh, but in this particular case, uh, you thought zebras, didn't you? Yeah, every now and again, it will be a zebra. <laughs> so, you know, as long as you've thought about the horses first. Okay. So shifting gears a bit from house. Um, when you started YouTube, why, why did you or what made you want to uh, go on YouTube? Um, I was doing a PhD, so I had a bit more free time and um, I have always kind of given presentations like at work, which are a bit kind of silly, a bit funny. So, you know, I'm, I'm not the best student in the world. I'm not the best academic in the world. 
but I, I was, you know, I, I would make up for it by being funny. So I'd crack mm. jokes in the presentations. And um, so, you know, I could tell people like that kind of style. Mm. And then one of my friends said, you know, why don't you just start putting these on, on YouTube? Um, and I did a bit of stand up comedy. I did a science stand up comedy. So people, again, said, you know, this. So I just thought, okay, fine. So I started making videos. And my number one regret in life. In all of, not just YouTube, in all of life, is I wish I'd started sooner. I, I really wish I'd got on YouTube 10 years earlier. Mm. Um, well, 10 years earlier, it would have been around the time it was created, I think. But, um, but you know, I, I think some of the, the channels I really enjoy and, and who've had a lot of success, um, obviously are great channels, but they also started early. They really, you know, saw that potential early on. Having said that, if you're, you know, anyone watching is thinking about making a channel mm. it's it's never too late now is actually a great time to start a channel mm. i think it's a really um you know exciting time to be to be getting onto the platform as well so um so that's not at all to suggest that it's too late but uh yeah i think that would have, i i i would have i would have um uh, you know loved to have been there earlier on uh so one thing you said over there caught my uh, interest uh, so when you are a medical doctor don't you get that title of doctor by just being in medical school what is the purpose of a phd while in medicine yeah no it's a good question um it's not to get the the doctor title because as you said that i've already got that but um this is in very competitive fields in particular or if you have a real interest in going into academia, then okay. you would, you know, do some full-time research. So I was in full-time research for three years. I would still do some shifts, but maybe just once a week, mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. do a on-call shift um, just to stay in touch. But um, I was basically doing research mm -hmm. for that, that period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it was because I had an interest in it, but it was, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest, because in cardiology, you really need to have a very good CV to get a good job. And if everybody else is doing some sort of higher degree in research, then if you don't have that, you're going to be at a disadvantage. And I think that's a bit of a problem because I think it's become almost something that you have to do mm -hmm. in fields like plastic surgery, cardiology, neurology. You know, these are fields which are very competitive. So you need to, to um, you know, set yourself apart to, to, to go for the top jobs. Um, but obviously a lot of people who do it are just genuinely interested in research. Mm. And I, I was at the time, but um, I'm definitely not now. It really put me off academia and, oh, okay. it, uh, you know, it was, I'm glad I tried, but it definitely wasn't for me. And now a lot of the videos I make are kind of all the problems with academia and, and all the ways where mm. I, I feel like it, it really is not in a good place. Um, and I've got some more videos planned along those lines as well. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, but it was a nice, I had two children. Well, my wife had the children, but <laughs> I, I kind of helped out, um, uh, during this period. So it is, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I've no regrets about doing it, even though I didn't really enjoy it so much. It was still a useful period in my life for sure. So when you finish your PhD, what would they call you at that point? Doctor, doctor? Well, Rubin? some people say doctor squared. Some people say <laughs> double doctor or anything, but uh, one is enough. <laughs> um, so I've, um, I've, no, I've, I've been a long time watcher of your channel and you're very vocal against alternative medicine. So uh, <laughs> what started you down this path? Yeah, it's, it's a good question, really. I think. Anyone who's kind of got an interest in science, you know, part of that is spotting, mm. uh, you, you, you're more able to spot kind of BS. And um, alternative medicine in particular, you know, I've seen patients directly suffer from the kind of uh, false promises mm. that alternative medicine delivers. And so, you know, the, the intention of my channel is not really straight kind of medical education, like, you know, what is a heart attack? What is diabetes? I think there are lots of other channels that do that much better. And, and I don't find that so interesting, but I wanted to try and help people 
themselves understand why it's unlikely that you know an alternative medicine is going to sort them out and why they you know uh, are correct to have trust in in modern medicine why do 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 we say that this works what is evidence based practice mm. um and you know I, I just got really fed up with a lot of these grifters just conning people so i think that was part of the motivation and um you know it's everywhere it's in every country you can't can't get away from it um and people suffer you know th this is a direct there are there are beliefs that people have which don't really have a big impact you know some one of my friends actually believes that the earth is flat and we've never been to the moon and this is somebody i interact with on a on a daily basis so it's not like they're in another you know part of society these are just regular people with these crazy beliefs but you know he has a normal life he works as a graphic designer and goes about a normal life but when you believe these these kind of crazy things when it comes to health it's got a direct impact and i've seen it with my family you know particularly the older generation really susceptible um especially the family that are here mm. in india you know i think it's particularly bad here they get exposed to a lot of it um has any of your uh, work been impacted or uh, has anything been harder for you because the patient saw an alternative medicine person and uh, uh, whatever they uh, whatever medical condition they had was directly because of this uh, you know whatever this patient did with alternative medicine has that happened to you Yeah, I've de definitely. I'm just trying to think of some examples. I mean, a lot of my patients are um, you know, they've had a heart attack, right? Mm -hmm. So in those kind of scenarios, I think people which I think is interesting in itself, they are less willing to mm -hmm. they're, they're more they're more willing to just go with what the traditional doctor is is saying. Mm -hmm. But there are other conditions where I think they're much more susceptible to this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. so when I've got patients who, you know, we we're, we're taking a preventive approach they've not had a problem yet then they are very susceptible to to the believing these kinds of things um and maybe they they will have some adverse markers of of mm. heart disease and i'll say look you should probably start a statin and um you know uh, have some lifestyle modification stop smoking cut out refined carbohydrates you know all these kind of sensible advice and they'll kind of go Uh you know actually I I I read something that ayurvedic herbs can reverse heart disease so I'm just going to go with that for now and I don't want to take your statins because I've been told statins are poison and they're going to you know make me diabetic and and uh, make me unwell so uh no thanks you know that that kind of interaction is is not uncommon maybe not ayurvedic herbs in every interaction maybe it'll be homeopathy or something else but I I get that a lot but i think other fields of medicine are very susceptible so one of my friends is a um, cardio oncologist so he deals with cardiac problems caused by cancer treatment and cancer itself um and obviously works with oncologists very closely and i think oncology you get a lot of these beliefs and you can you know you you know i i never want to attack the patients for for believing these things imagine you've just been diagnosed with cancer you're you, you know a young woman for example a lot, a lot of his patients are breast cancer Mm. um uh, patients and it's a very emotive upsetting diagnosis you know so a lot of people go mm. into denial they 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 will look for any kind of reason to avoid starting chemotherapy because that is accepting that you have you have got cancer so they will look for any other potential treatment that they maybe can they can try and um so he was saying particularly with with very emotive diagnoses like that he sees a lot of this and uh, sometimes it's harmless in that it's you know homeopathy which is which has no active ingredient at all but a lot of the time it's it's genuinely you know harmful either by mm. interacting with other medications or by itself being toxic so i think in my practice i don't see it so often just by the nature of the diseases i treat but a lot of my colleagues have and then you know some friends in america the stories they tell are just just wild you know people mm. taking completely dangerous things mercury you know th things like that 
and and le- ending up with i mean obviously you were talking with with dr phillips you know uh, with liver failure with with um um irreversible sort of damage to their skin mm. these kinds of things so yeah you know it, it's much more common than i think we th- we we realize uh i want to ask you but what's your opinion about the ayush ministry and or the state of the industry the altered medicine industry in india yeah i mean so that was actually the the presentation i gave which led to one of my friends saying why don't you put this kind of stuff on youtube because i was at the science museum in london which is a very historic uh, when was this this would have been 2016 oh. uh 17 i think i posted my first video i started posting kind of 2018 19 properly so it would have been about 2017 and well it, it was because it was um uh related to independence day mm. and so the science museum which is this you know brilliant museum one of the best science museums in the world huge it's over 150 years old um and i had many happy memories going there as a kid and it very much created a interest in science in me um was doing a special um exhibition on indian science and the contribution of india to science where i thought oh fantastic that's really wonderful to see and i was invited to give a talk about um you know a kind of comedic talk on the, on the topic and the guy the keynote speaker for this indian science season this you know big lots of money poured into this was sadguru and he was the keynote speaker at the science museum in the uk right so i was you know i hadn't really heard a lot about him i'd i'd heard bits and pieces that, you know and kind of wacky things that he said and i know you've obviously covered him a few times um so i went there and just kind of pissed all over the lawn because i just made fun of the whole exhibition at the exhibition um and uh then was bringing it to like how you know all the stuff i think you've talked about a lot of this stuff before and i i i went into this in a video i made about covid in india and why the response to covid was particularly kind of bad here um you know and i i think a lot of people watching will have heard these things before but if if you know there are viewers who are less familiar with the kind of indian history you know it was very much from the inception of um of of independent in india with nehru speech about a scientific temperament and everything and how you know indians uh, love science you know we have so many fantastic scientists that have come out of the country and of course indians in other countries are are very uh you know v- very likely to to go into science and medicine you know mm-hmm. uh we we are overrepresented in these fields um and yet there's this side this very unscientific side of of indian society and you know i have these interactions in in my own family you know i've got engineers but then their families will you know do completely sort of wacky kind of celebrations uh, or um ceremonies um uh and and the two kind of live side by side mm. now sometimes that's absolutely fine you know it's it's harmless like when i was getting married my mother-in-law insisted that we had to go through all the astrology stuff you know and i'm kind of sitting there rolling my eyes but it's harmless whatever you know, choose a certain date okay i went along with it but um uh when it comes again you know to health uh, i i've had um family members r- reject advice that i'm telling them because they want to go to see their mm. uh, their tibetan medicine practitioner or ayurvedic or home- homeopaths or whatever and um so what i was talking about in that talk was was uh how this has been side by side but it's kind of been weaponized in the kind of modi era mm. with the promotion of what was essentially a fringe group mm. into this full yep. ministry of yep. ayush and it's very much tied up in this kind of culture war ideology about how we we can reject western medicine because we have our own medicine mm. which is which is just as good and that's obviously mischaracterizing western medicine as western i mean yeah. so many of the contributions of western medicine have come from India have come from around the world the east there is no western medicine there is just modern medicine and so it was a completely you know you know a faulty foundation for this whole thing 
and this promotion of the kind of pseudoscience within Ayush and, you know, how you've got politicians talking about drinking cow urine and all these kind of crazy things. I was kind of aghast because I had been brought up. My mom wasn't, um, uh, you know, a scientist uh, by training, but had always kind of instilled that interest in me. So I grew up, you know, by this point, I'm now out, out outside India. And, um, you know, I had sort of uh, kind of, I guess, engineering on my, my mom's side. Um, and even my dad, who's, who's English, his father was, was a, a chemist. Um, and um, so, as in sort of a scientist. And so I had this, this, this idea of, of science and kind of what, what I grew, grew up learning about all the great, kind of great Indian scientists. So it was a bit of a shock then learning how modern India had kind of gone in this different direction. Um, and yeah, you know, that's, I guess, how we, we first started talking as well, because mm -hmm. I, I was just kind of trying to familiarize myself with what modern India is like in terms of... Now, that's not at all to say I'm, I'm under no illusion that that's everyone. I know that there are still fantastic scientists doing fantastic work here, particularly in, in the medical field, which is what I know best. But the, the national conversation, I think, has been really led in a funny direction by this, this whole kind of Ayush movement. And so some of the more silly things I was making fun of as well is, you know, different politicians talking about how um, head transplants had been done yeah. in the past because of Ganesh, how, um, you know, we invented flight because of different flying chariots. And, I, you know, I, I feel like, do they really believe what they're saying or is this just a whip up kind of mm. jingoistic mm. support? So I, I don't know for definite, but it's just bizarre to see that people are saying this in 2023 or 20, 2017 as it was then. Yeah, there are definitely uh, religious and nationalistic motivations behind all these uh, pseudoscientific lies that are propagated just so the audience, their audience can be proud of it. And there are many creators doing that. I think the problem is that there are very few voices calling them out mm. for all the bullshit they speak. And uh, that's what I always say that we need more of. But yeah. No, no, I, I agree. And I think, you know, and I'm kind of, you know, one of the things I, I, I wanted to kind of ask you about today is, is uh, the state of kind of science communication in, mm -hmm. in India, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm outside India. Mm -hmm. I'm not kind of in touch with the, the, the kind of YouTube scene, certainly, mm -hmm. but I know a few journalists who, who write these kind of rationalist um, kind of pieces and, and, and talk about it, but I haven't seen a lot on, on YouTube. Mm. And you seem to be, you know, one of a very few number of channels talking about this kind of stuff. And I don't know why, because, you know, there are a lot of very level-headed, sensible people here. Is it just because, you know, YouTube as a, as a career is, is a new thing and it's not taking off? But, you know, I would have still expected some dilettante part-timers like me to, mm. to, to be talking about this kind of thing. Um, and, you know, what, what is, wh why is science communication in the state it's in, in India? I mean, what are your thoughts? Uh, so I think there are multiple factors, multiple reasons leading to the state of science communication. Um, one thing is that YouTube itself as a profession, uh, aside from the fact that it's uh, just, really hard by default like for someone starting out uh, no matter where they are uh, I think uh, in India particularly uh, science doesn't often get an audience and I have a few few theories about why uh, we were speaking about this and uh, I think one reason could be the fact that uh, science is, is not kind of looked at as something that's intrinsically valuable, but as something that can lead to a lucrative job or something that can earn people money. So families, when they uh, push their children into science, uh, they don't do it because science is something they find interesting or they 
kids might find interesting they do it cuz uh, they might make money out of it so uh, and that's only one of the reasons there are reasons like uh, the uh, f- the education system focuses way too much on the entry level so mm. the focus is on the exams and uh, there's a lot of learning things by heart without l- understanding what the actual concept is and so this rote learning is another factor so there are all these multiple factors that uh, lead to people not appreciating the intrinsic value of science and uh, uh, and again there's only my opinion my theory and what's actually wrong and in the end what that leads to is very bad audience for uh, science content on youtube in india and it's true for uh, even something offline like if you try to hold a talk um, on any science topic offline um and if the only places where you uh, get uh, a venue to hold such talks are like schools and their auditoriums like i was in one just recently i was in one yesterday and i could see like the students would see the word science in the title of the talk and that will instantly turn them off mm. and some of this i'd say is the fault of the teachers who teach them because they probably also gone through a childhood where uh, they went through all these all of what i said where they didn't learn science for the uh, for the actual love of science uh, they learn science for <laughs> uh, for getting into a mm. job that can make the money but uh, yeah uh, when those same people become teachers they end up creating students who don't uh, appreciate science the way it's the way i think it should be appreciated so uh, yeah all these factors kind of lead to a situation where uh, you know science communication is not really uh, like you have people here that are really well educated in science but uh, they don't really appreciate science enough to actually understand that those are questions those are tools you have to answer questions that you face in life they uh, they only see it as a means to uh, an end and that end being money uh, so yeah i think those are some of the reasons why i think science communication is very bad in india and me personally also uh, i notice that when i do videos on uh, pure science topics uh, they tend to get get very few much fewer views than something a little more divisive something more uh, rationalism themed um those videos are what get me more views and me personally even though i do want to do more science focused videos uh the nature of this profession is such that you end up having to do more videos that um uh, that get you traction that get you views and so even I, even though i want to do a lot more science communication than what i do i don't get that opportunity so yeah i rambled a bit but i hope i answered your yeah question. i mean i no i th- i think um i've had similar thoughts certainly about the education system from from what i know about it um and and your cousins and and uh, nieces and nephews here who um you know work incredibly hard i i think you know certainly getting into higher education here is is phenomenally difficult and um the the education system does its best to kind of stamp out any joy mm. and and just sort of focus on on exams uh, which is a real shame you know and i think i think that is very very sad um because i was talking to some of these these um nephews yesterday and they're all sort of you know 13 14 and i said you know what do you like doing in school and they said oh we you know we love science and they were all really enthusiastic about science um and uh, they they 
young enough that it hasn't been kind of that the the spark hasn't been extinguished. Mm. <laughs> but I said, so you know, what science YouTube channels do you watch? I'm, this is my segue into telling them that I'm the cool <laughs> cool uncle with a YouTube channel. But I never actually got to tell them that because they were like, no, we don't watch any science on YouTube. I said, oh, okay. What do you watch? Just anime. And I said, okay, well that that's cool. But um, uh, you know, are, are there any kind of science channels that you know and they're like yeah not that interested so i was like oh okay so that is a bit different but i know that there is an interest here because often on my videos the third highest country of views comes from india, india. uh so us is the number one about 40 percent of my views come from the us and then about 25 percent from the uk and obviously this is skewed because my languages are in english so then you know canada australia also tend to score uh, highly, but frequently India is number three or four. So I know that there are people interested in 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 talking about science, not in a way that is going to help them with a, an essay or a, a, an assignment. You know, and and of course the the irony of science communication not being so popular in in India is all the memes in America about education are about Indian YouTube channels. Have you seen these these yeah, memes? Yep, you know yep. how yeah. like you know my teacher can't tell me anything one Indian guy on YouTube and I get all the answers from him. And, and, you know, I always find those quite, quite sort of uh, cute that, uh, you know, it makes me happy that, that, that people are finding these really useful around the world, but they're very much didactic kind of lecture based and they're, um, they're stuff you would look up. They're not stuff that will be algorithmically mm. put forward to viewers. It'll be like, I need to, you know, learn how to do, um, quadratic equation or something. I'll go and look it up. Whereas the kind of content you and I make is more, you know, it's not going to help anyone necessarily. Not academic. It's not academic. It's yeah. more just interest, general yeah. interest. So that's it's it's a different kind of of thing. But but having said all of that, I am still surprised mm -hmm. that that there isn't more. And I was mentioning to you in in the car actually. Um, so I'll just say to the viewers as well that. Um, a few years ago, I saw that there was a Educon um, that happened in India. So I, I had organized a UK version of this. And Educon is like VidCon, which is the big YouTuber meet. And I don't know if you've ever been to a VidCon, but there's nothing that makes you th r r realize how abnormal we are as YouTubers than going to a VidCon. I think it only happens in the West. It's it in the U US happen. and Europe a few times, not always, but the US is, 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 uh, but you know, a lot, it's very well attended, but you go to a VidCon, number one, I walk in there, I'm like more than double the average age. So that's the first thing I feel like I'm a school teacher and, and there are all these crazy, you know, kids running around. Um, and just mainstream YouTube is horrendous and I want nothing to do with it. So my educational little corner of YouTube with the total nerds mm. and I'm very happy to stay in this little corner. So we have our own educational thing, which has run a few times and it hasn't happened because we had support from YouTube for a bit and they, they pulled out. But, um, uh, you know, it's a lot of the big educational channels that people will have heard of and, and, and big and small, and we all met up and it was great. It was great fun. Um, and then I heard that there was a Educon in, in Mumbai and I was like, Oh wow, that's fantastic. So I, couldn't find a lot of information about it, but I went to look at their photos from the previous year and I went to look up all the different YouTube channels that were there. And I wouldn't describe any of them as educational. They were all like random kind of self-help, spirituality, cooking, um, and even politics and stuff. There was no science at all. Not a single channel was related to science that I could mm. see. So I, I just thought, wow, this is a very different kind of um, ecosystem. Mm. Mm. Um, but, you know, I, I, I definitely think there is, is potential for it. There is. You know, and, and, and I know that people are interested in, in mm. science here. I know they are. So, so uh, you know, hopefully you will inspire others to do similar things. Yeah, hopefully he's doing a lot of uh, uh, heavy lifting there. No, no, I'm <laughs> optimistic. I'm optimistic. Yeah, um, I think the treatment science usually gets or mostly gets inside India is uh, purely academic. And the exposure most people have to science is academic. So uh, in uh, from what you said about your nieces and nephews, I think... Um, if they are studying here in India, 
most of the science they're exposed to uh, is also probably academic. So, and I'm not saying that can't be interesting. That definitely can be interesting. But uh, I'm more curious to know if they have venues where they get exposure, non-academic exposure to science. And uh, it's it might be because they don't get that exposure that they would rather, uh, you know, watch anime uh, when whenever they get some non-academic uh, venues to do mm-hmm. anything, they would rather watch anime or whatever. I I feel like there should be something non-academic, academic where people can, uh, you know, get exposure to science, scientific topics. Yeah. And uh, this, I mean, uh, how much TV do, do people watch these days? Young people in the I, in India. I think um, younger people don't watch a lot of TV. They watch stuff like Netflix or yeah, sure, yeah, OTT. Yeah, I yeah. think that's the same. Yeah, same in 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 the UK. But growing up, I think you know TV was much more of a big thing when I, in the nineties when I was a kid, and my favorite TV programs were kind of. Um, Doc, uh, entertainment, docu entertainment, science stuff, and uh, uh, Indian stuff. No, no, in, in the UK, mm. and um, absolutely that inspired me. You know the, those kind of TV shows um, with the kinds of people like Brian Cox. Um, obviously, he wasn't there in the nineties, but you had other other kinds of presenters that would be kind of you know Bill Nye in America. Mm-hmm. Very much, mm-hmm. a lot of people credit him with inspiring them into science. Um, and, you know, going back the, the kind of archetype of the science communicator was, was Carl Sagan. Um, and so in the West, I think we've had that model of a Mm. kind of celebrity teacher, but not, not in a, in a, in a kind of entertaining way, not entertaining, like funny, but, but just kind of accessible. That's the Mm -hmm. word I'm looking for. And that's very much been David Attenborough, of course, you know, I've, I've not mentioned him. He's, he's. Yeah, he's even more of an archetype than than (laughs) Carl Sagan. Sagan, Um, And so, I I, you know when I when I was asking you about whether there are similar kind of Indian figures like that on TV, I don't know if that's the case really. And and the famous scientists are are full time scientists; they're not science communicators. Mm. And science communication, I think, as a term, is actually quite a recent thing. Like when I started on this whole YouTube thing, I'd never heard of it, Mm -hmm. and then I. Uh, so you were asking about events, you know, and, and there were a few sci- SciComm conferences. Mm. They're niche. I'm not going to say that they're very big or anything. I don't think it's like loads of people. It, it still felt like uh, not many people were, were that interested in kind of learning about science communication. And I went to a couple of these and actually I found them not very useful. Uh, and, and I found that, that there were people who were more interested in talking about science communication rather than doing science communication. So I just said, oh, I'm just going to go and do, do my own thing. But in recent years, I've become much more interested in, in how we actually talk about science and what kind of impact we can have as science communicators. And it's made me change the way I make my content a bit to try and be more persuasive rather than just kind of pure entertainment. And um, I think it's a new field. So I think I, I wouldn't lose hope that, that, you know, I think probably America, UK, uh, no, I'd say, say for example, French. So I, sp- I speak French and, and I um, uh, sought out some medical French YouTubers and I, I've met a couple mm. and they were like, we're the only ones. Like there's barely anyone doing it here. So even, you know, it, it, I, I think the US and the UK maybe are, are slightly unusual. Um, so I wouldn't, I, I think the whole field is new and I think there's definitely potential for, for things to grow. Since we're on the topic, I had a couple of questions on this. And you also mentioned that, uh, uh, you know, you organized live events in the UK. And uh, I've seen you do uh, stand-up on uh, science topics. So, uh, from what you've seen uh, or in your experience, uh, is science communication something more effective when done online? or uh, is it more effective offline or what are the differences that you've seen in both? Uh, I don't know if any is more effective. I think mm. obviously you can reach 
far more people online mm. and with my schedule being a bit erratic and family and, and things like that for me online is very much mm. um what i prefer because i can do it in my own time mm. um the live things i do is is not i'll tell you the first thing is don't do it for money reasons because there's absolutely no money in live live performances unless you're like selling out an arena like brian cox or something but um you know, it's it's purely for fun. You know, that there is a real buzz doing a live event and making a crowd full of people laugh. That 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 feels really good. But that's just for my own enjoyment. I think if you're really looking to make an impact, um, then you know, look at what we have available to us now with with YouTube and obviously other platforms there, TikTok, Instagram, so on. But one advice I'd give is try to focus. Don't try and do everything. Mm. I think try and choose one or two platforms and really try and nail those down. And for me, and I'm biased, YouTube is S tier. I think everything else comes below YouTube. Um, and you can see that with a lot of the big TikTokers desperately trying to break into YouTube. Um, but the, you know, the democratization of, of all of this content creation now is incredible. You just need a smartphone. You know, probably I'd invest in a microphone, but that's the only thing. They don't have to be this fancy. You've got very fancy microphones here. But um, thank you. <laughs> the uh, you know, I'd, I'd say you can make you can upload to YouTube with just a smartphone, mm. a microphone. And that's it. That's all you need now. So you know, you've got potential to influence far more people than ever before. It was so prohibitive beforehand mm. to to, mm. to to get onto TV or, or the radio or you know, print print media is is changed completely now. Circulation of of the kind of big newspapers is a fraction of what it used to be. Um, so people are getting their their information from from all kinds of sources. So I think, in terms of effectiveness, if you're measuring impact, I think online is unparalleled. Mm. Um, and uh, but you know, you, you got to do what you enjoy. I've got friends who um, really enjoy the the live stuff, so they do much more live performances and live events festivals and you know there'll be science festivals in, in different places in the uk so last year i and and this this year i decided to to really try and do a bit more of those so i did um uh the northern ireland science festival and went out there and that was my first solo gig so people just just came to see me which was mm -hmm. very daunting because normally i'd be like with other people doing a comedy event Whereas this was just me on a Friday night at nine o'clock. And uh, um, it was, you know, good to challenge, challenge yourself. And it was great. It was, it was a sellout. Um, so I was very pleased how it went. Um, but it was a totally different audience. You know, YouTube, I'll get uh, mostly young kind of people. So you can, YouTube is very good at telling you kind of demographics. So I'll get kind of 18 to 35 is my peak kind of uh, age range. 80% male, which is quite typical for science content, which is a bit of a shame that, that it is so skewed. Even female science creators say that, you know, they get a very skewed um, audience like that. I think that one of the reasons for that is because YouTube itself is primarily... Totally, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that girls have no interest. I'm saying the opposite. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of girls have interest in science, but they're not necessarily getting shown the same content. Um so I'll, I'll definitely skew to the younger end of the audience on YouTube. Whereas at this live event, I was getting, you know, mm. people who'd retired. I was getting all kinds of ages. And that was a bit scary when I, you know, before the lights went down. And I'm like, I don't know, I've never done a comedy event for, for this kind of age range, but it, but it went fine in the end. So, so uh, you know, whatever, you've got to enjoy what you're doing. Um, but, but yeah, you know, I couldn't dream of reaching so many people as, as I can on YouTube. Um. So a friend of mine who does stand up, has, uh, he also uh, would do YouTube and he has noticed that the way he delivers um, uh, on, I mean, when he does his performance, stand up performance, kind of changed because um, he would get a little more smoother or confident in his jokes or delivery when he did his YouTube videos, has uh, something like that happened with you where something you do offline or online affected the other? I don't think so. Um, I think I'm from the kind of more traditional uh, kind of comedy style in that I grew up with the kind of classic 
American stand-ups of the of the eighties and nineties, uh, as as the people like you know the George Carlin's and Dave Chappelle's and and um, you know people like that who 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 Seinfeld and Bill Hicks and everything who really kind of um, shaped what I think of as as comedy. Mm-hmm. Whereas YouTube comedy and certainly TikTok comedy is a whole different thing. I'm not going to um, say anything derogatory. I'm not. I'm not being snobbish, but it's a very different thing. It's much more kind of editing dependent, you know, it's punchy, you know, very fast paced kind of stuff. Whereas I think my videos, some of them I don't even cut, you know, I've just mm. do a si- single take and they are basically as if I was talking on stage. Um, so I don't think it's changed my stuff that much, but there are comedians who've really leveraged it very clev- in a very clever way. So mm. Andrew Schultz is, is, is one guy who wasn't yep. really that well known before the pandemic, but then when everyone, when live events weren't happening, he really pivoted to YouTube in a very effective way. And then that has exploded his live events now. And he's mm. selling out ra- wor- around the world. He's had a huge, very successful special that he put out online. Um, so I think he, you know, if, you know, he's not alone, but a lot of comics, the most successful comics have really embraced the kind of live stuff. Uh, the the online stuff to boost mm. their live stuff. Nice, nice. I'd like to take a small break here and mention that as an independent content creator, my main source of income is my audience. If you'd like to support me through Patreon, buy me coffee or YouTube memberships, you can find the links below. And now back to the rest of the podcast. So uh, shifting gears again a little bit, I want to get into uh, one of the recent videos you made. So if anyone hasn't watched it yet, he has a video on his channel about the placebo effect. So uh, he goes into uh, how how fascinating it can be and how little we know about it and uh, how effective it can be despite the fact that the most simplified way in which we look at it at a placebo is as a dummy medicine and uh, uh, I want to ask you something regarding this you go into uh, a topic in that video sham surgery Mm. is an actual thing for uh, people who don't know who want to know can you uh, tell us what sham surgery is yeah I mean when I've mentioned this in in previous videos um, some of the comments are like you know how can you do this it's unethical and that response made me think, ah, maybe there is, you know, something I can sort of talk about this in more detail. So that kind of was one of the things that led to me wanting to make the placebo effect video. Plus the placebo effect is just kind of, you know, fascinating. Um, and so when we're talking about, so it's a bit confusing. So there's placebo effects and placebo as a, mm-hmm. as a noun. So um, we shorten it, which makes it a bit confusing. But technically when we say placebo, we actually mean a dummy treatment mm. and the placebo effect is the, the effect we're talking about where people can have a, a, an improvement in their symptoms, even with an ineffective treatment. And of course that's, you know, a vital importance when you're talking about things like alternative medicine to understand that sometimes medications or treatments without any effect, uh, without any active ingredient can still make people feel better. So I think everyone understands that basic concept. And when you're testing that in a trial, uh, a a new drug, so if you come out with a new drug and you want to sell it to the public and I'm the regulatory body, I say, hang on, you've got to test this against a placebo. So you run a trial where you have 100 people who get your medication and 100 people who get a placebo, identical, ideally identical medication, but it's you know, commonly referred to as a sugar pill, but it it can take various forms. It's just something inert. And the people in the trial shouldn't know which arm they're in. And then any improvement, because both groups tend to improve, but of course, one group with the dummy treatment, with the placebo, that's the placebo effect. And it's also other things, regression to the mean as well. And if you have a more of an improvement in the active ingredient arm, that then you've proven your, your medication has an effect. So that's fine. People understand that. But then that's not the only treatment that doctors offer, right? We, we don't just give drugs. We also do operations. We do procedures. Mm. 
And um, the, why, why are those exempt from being tested in the same way? And we actually don't do sham surgery trials anywhere near as much as I think we should. Now, obviously, for something like, you know, trauma surgery, somebody's got a gunshot wound, we're not going to say, right, we're going to randomize you into the, uh, you know, the placebo arm. arm where we just put uh, saline on your wound and send you home. Um, that doesn't need a, a trial. But for a lot of surgery, probably actually the majority of procedures and surgeries that we do, they are not for that kind of urgent stuff. They are more for chronic problems, joint replacements and joint surgery, back surgery for chronic back pain. And um, uh, my field, which at one point was the most performed medical procedure in the entire world, which is stenting of the coronary mm -hmm. arteries, which is a extremely successful business here in India where it's you can, <laughs> almost everybody ends up getting a stent. Um, and, you know, I do this day in, day out. So... It, we've been doing this for 40 years. Well, we haven't been stenting for 40 years, but the first um, angioplasty to a coronary artery was done in 1977. And then stenting came about 20 years later. And um, that's where we put a little metal tube inside one of the arteries in the heart. We open it up with a balloon and any narrowing and put a metal tube inside and, and, and blow up a balloon and, and leave the tube inside and it stays there. So it seems completely... <laughs> intuitive that if you're opening up a blockage like plumbing, if you're clearing a blockage, it should make things better. And we thought this for many, many years, and it seemed entirely reasonable to think that. Just the way it seemed entirely reasonable that people with a meniscal tear in their knee, if you shave off that little tear of the, um, the, uh, the cartilage, um, that would make the knee pain better. Just like we thought that people with stress fractures in their vertebral bodies and the spine, if we put a bit of cement in the vertebral body to make it um, firm again, that will improve pain. All of these things make perfect sense. They're totally intuitive. They're not like fairy dust that we're, we're you know, it sounds like it's got a mechanism there. All of these things have finally, after many, many years, undergone sham uh, trials. And I haven't even answered your question yet, but I've, I've been building up to it. So what is a sham trial is where you do exactly the same as in the placebo drug trial, but you do it with the operation. So you randomize people into two different groups. You don't tell them which one they're in, but how can you fool somebody that they've had surgery? Well, you, you literally do what, you know, the, the, all the parts of the operation except the actual surgery. So you anesthetize the patient, put them to sleep, Sometimes we'll even cut them, cut them open. So for the knee one, they, they did an arthroscopy. They looked inside the joint, but they didn't do any treatment. And for stenting, and I did some of these procedures in, in the kind of uh, trials that showed this, um, our hospital was, was the biggest um, recruiting center, uh, is we gave the patient noise-canceling headphones and a music of their choice. We gave them some sedatives, so they're a bit kind of sleepy. And then we do an angiogram, so we take all the pictures, but then we just kind of pretend. We act and, you know, I'll say to the nurse, oh, can I have this? And the nurse will pretend to blow the balloon up and it's not connected to anything. And it's all, it's kind of, kind of bizarre um, theater, but it's the whole point is to avoid that placebo effect. Because if the patient has any clue that they uh, did or didn't have the procedure, you know, if they see us taking out a stent um, and, and putting it in, and then they're going to be, ah, oh, I had the stent, right? I'm going to start feeling better now because my chest pain is going to get better. Or if they know that it's all over in five minutes, they can't have possibly been, had the stent, then they, they may not get it. You know, they, they will have a different outcome. Um, and so that's what they did in all, all these sham surgery trials. And there haven't been many through history. And um, there are some really interesting publications looking at how many operations have actually undergone sham surgery trials. And it's not many. And many of them have been shown to be not, not useful or far less useful than we thought. And for stenting, we, we know that. Now, let me be clear. Stenting in an emergency setting when someone's had a heart attack 
is a life-saving treatment. It is extremely effective. We've done all the trials looking at that, and it's one of the most effective treatments in medicine. So, so that's, I don't want to say that stents don't have any use, but for someone who has got stable heart pain, so that they go up the stairs, they get you know, a little bit of chest pain, but it settles down. They have no red flag symptoms. They don't have, I won't go into the details, but you know, it's a large group of people with these symptoms. Putting stents in them makes them feel better makes them feel better. So, so for years we thought we're doing great. And, you know, it, some people frame this as a kind of money-making conspiracy or something. I think the total opposite. It's because doctors, you know, we want to think we're helping people, right? So we go into medicine to help people. So when you do a procedure, it's very powerful to, to, to feel like you're helping someone. So we all want to believe it works. The patient wants to believe it works. But what these trials showed is that actually that's a placebo. That's a placebo effect. That is, they are mm-hmm. the people who didn't get any stenting, but they had all the other mm-hmm. ceremony of the procedure had a, a statistically s- the same outcome. Now there are, there are criticisms to make of the trial, of course, like any trial and more, res- there's a follow-up trials going on now and everything, but that was done at six weeks, six weeks following the procedure, they had the same reduction in symptoms. And we already know from previous trials that there's no life expectancy difference. So symptoms really was the only thing we were doing it for. And the symptoms had all got better. So that means that there's such a powerful effect from a placebo surgery. In fact, it's much more powerful than the placebo effect from a a drug. We know that if you give a placebo tablet to someone, Mm. they get a certain benefit. If you give trials where they give a placebo injection, just of saline, so nothing in... That is more powerful. Mm. It's, it had a pain-killing effect in, in trials, which was almost comparable to morphine. And then uh, sham surgery is the most powerful because you've got all this kind of theater and ceremony of, of what mm. constitutes mon- me- modern medicine. And I just found this whole thing fascinating because then you start thinking about all different aspects of an encounter with a doctor. You know, what's the room like? What's the hospital like? What's the doctor dressed? How they, how, what's their bedside manner? And that's why I think people find certain doctors just make them feel better because they have mm. a very good bedside manner. So it made me really kind of think about my own practice. And, you know, there are good and bad sides to that because there are some things that you can't change. And, and you know, it may be that a, a patient might feel that a, a female doctor is just not as knowledgeable you know they may have their inherent bias so then a female doctor you know what's she going to do she can't change her sex so she you know it's 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 it also makes it's got some kind of negative connotations to it but then you you understand why private hospitals are so fancy why they're so nice where they come and treat you like a um vip obviously it's to get your money but why it it it's to all to generate this kind of maximize this placebo effect and I try and do that in my own practice in a, in a ethical way, but you know, I will, I will never lie, but I will try and explain, you know, after I've, I've done a procedure, I'll say, wow, this was a fantastic result. Oh, it's great. You know, it was, it was tricky, but we were, it was a fantastic team here. We really did really well. And then I show them the pictures and look at this. It's, it's amazing. You're going to be running marathons and all the, you know, it's a bit of, bit of joking around. But I, I genuinely believe that that will mm. make them feel a bit better. So, so it's just, a, you know, I, think, I find it such an endlessly fascinating concept. And sham surgery, you know, to come back to those people saying, is it ethical? I think that's a good question. I think it is because we are consenting the people in the trial fully that mm. they may not have the treatment. And I got to, you know, we've got to always be immensely grateful to these kind of patients who go in these trials. Because imagine you're going into a trial for something like a cardiac stent and 20 years, and most doctors as well, I'm not saying just the general, doctors believe that it, it makes you live longer and, and, and it makes you feel better. To then agree to go into a trial where you may not get that treatment, I think is, is very brave and we're really grateful to those patients. So there are lots of very lucrative, very commonly performed operations that have never been tested in this way. Um, and you know, I was saying, you know, life, life threatening kinds of things less commonly, but there is a historical precedent to cancer surgery Mm. as well. The, the, 
and this has got sort of overlay of, of, of a lot of sexism that used to be in medicine a hundred years ago. Mm. Most, well, almost all doctors were, were men mm. and doing breast surgery for breast cancer. And their bias was that the more aggressive they are, the better the outcome will be. So they started just taking out the tumor and they said, no, no, now we've got to take out the lymph nodes. Now we've got to take out the whole breast. Now we've got to take out lymph nodes on the other side. And it became known as, you know, radical mastectomy. So you just clear, and then even taking the pectoral muscle out. The more and more aggressive, that makes sense to, at the time. And the framework they had, the mental framework they had, cancer is bad, the more we can take out, the better. And it, it took decades before it was overturned when trials were done to show less aggressive surgery versus the most aggressive surgery, outcomes were actually better. For the less aggressive group because they didn't have complications caused by the very aggressive surgery and it was there was really only in the 1960s you know this has been done since the 1890s mm -hmm. and so you know just because something is an operation people think it definitely works but that's not the case so i think there there are more sham surgeries that we should be we should be doing i have a bunch of questions here uh, first uh when you select patients who are not too risky, like uh, who don't have very high risk if they don't actually get the stent, for example, um, you select them for these kinds of surgeries. Isn't that kind of non-random? It's Absolutely. So that's, that's, a, that's a crucial point to all medical trials is you've always got to look at what population was enrolled. So these trials, all of these trials, they didn't have patients with very critical disease right at the beginning of, of the main blood vessel. So if your take-home message from this trial is, oh, stents do nothing, then you, you've missed a point. And actually you're going to be causing some patients to miss out on life-saving treatment. Um, so yes, I totally agree. You've got to understand patient selection. You've got to realize that every medical trial is done in a, you've got to look at the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Is this relevant to my patient in front of me? Because the patient in front of me is an individual. Mm. They have, they, and uh, you know, um, uh, Occam's razor. I'm telling you all these, yeah, yeah. these, uh, things that we, o we Occam's uh, razor for those who want to know is that when you have a problem and you have multiple solutions for the same problem, the simplest one is usually, uh, the best or, uh, is the most, most effective. Is the that mo like the simplest explanation is, is likely to be the, the true one. And so yeah. in medicine, you know, if one, if one diagnosis can explain the symptoms, then that's going to be the answer. But then there was another one called, I forgot. It's not, it's not, uh, a razor. It's like, uh, Hanlon's something or other. Um, but uh, Hanlon's. Canyon I, or something. I know there are a couple and, 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 like and, that. and it's basically, uh, patients can have as many diagnoses as they damn well please. And it's basically saying that in reality, you know, you can't blindly follow these kinds of rules of thumb and saying, so the patient in front of you is an individual. They will have their own complexities. They are not a population. Medical trials tell you about a population and especially in cardiology, my God, some of the trials in cardiology have hundreds of thousands of participants. Mm -hmm. And now in the era of big data where we can electronically analyze you know, the, the UK actually is a, is a leader in this field. We've got something called the UK Biobank, where you've got an enormous volume of data on hundreds of thousands of people who've, who've participated in this trial. And anyone can access it. Mm. You can just go there and uh, pay and, and access this data. And it's got unparalleled amounts of information about many, many different people, types of people. Um, so you can... And th th there's actually a bot on Twitter that pulls out um, genome-wide association studies, GWAS studies, out of these trials, which with the most spurious, you know, links like people who play PlayStation are more likely to, you know, have brown eyes or, you know, all kinds of mad things like this. And, and you can just create these nonsensical things. Um, but uh, now in this era of big data, you can pull out all kinds of interesting findings from these vast data sets. But does that mean it has to dictate exactly what I do with the patient in front of me? No, you've still got to have clinical judgment. Otherwise, you know, there's no point of having doctors. That's, that's uh, why I, I'm not worried about AI 
replacing me anytime soon mm -hmm. because you have to exercise that sort of ability to weigh up all the information and evidence and put it into practice. So, uh, you know, if you just say blindly, well, I'm not going to do any more stents, then, then, then that's missing the point. So absolutely, I, I agree. You've got to personalize your recommendations to the patient in front of you. And the flip side of that is, you know, you can also, um, you know, there's, there's been a big move in, in recent years get away from a paternalistic approach to medicine to involve the patient in their care. So now, you know, it'll say to me, someone with a severe valve disorder, surgery is the option. If the patient in front of me is 85 years old and um, they, they, their objectives in life are just to, you know, play with their grandchildren and, and go down to the shops, do they need to be having this surgery? So I, I will say to them, look, the guidelines say that we should be cutting you open, but maybe that's not what you want to do, you know? So what do you think? And, and you know, I, I feel like the art of medicine is, is, is having these conversations and in involving the patient. So some surgeries you won't do, some you will, and, and you've got to always remember the limitations of, of trial data for sure. To someone who uses the existence of sham surgeries as a defense for an actual placebo treatment like something like homeopathy. They say that, hey, placebo effect works. So why don't you take this medicine I'm giving you? Uh, it'll work for you. Uh, I've seen it work for people. So what's your, uh, what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean... So I think the important thing to say with these trials with an observed improvement in the placebo arm is that it, this is not a permanent, this is not a, mm -hmm. a, a permanent improvement. And, and for things like headache and, um, you know, pain um, that are symptoms that come and go, you know, they're periodic. Mind-mediated symptom? Mind-mediated? Well, I mean, I think... All symptoms have an aspect of, of the mind modulating them, but certainly pain and, and, and subjective things, which can't be measured with a blood test. You know, when the outcome is a hard outcome, size of tumor on a scan or level of blood test elevation, it's, it's obvious what the result is. So you can't, you can't, you know, fake that. Um, and uh, people who, when, when some of those things have been observed, like a reduction in, in, um, tumor size, people say, oh, that's the placebo effect. Wow. It's so powerful. That's not the placebo. That's probably regression to the mean. Mm. So regression to the mean is that everything in biology has a natural variability to it. So, you know, pain will come and go. And if you have a particularly bad episode of pain and you get some homeopathic treatment, then your pain gets better, it probably would have got better anyway because mm -hmm. it will just settle back to the mean mm -hmm. if you're going up and down in terms of your symptoms. And that can even happen with things like tumors. So, you know, tumors can shrink in size on their own. And um, that's not evidence that the placebo effect is, is shrinking tumors. So I think sometimes we over-label changes as placebo effect when actually it's probably just more variability. Um, so what was the, what was the, uh, uh, the question was when, if someone, uh, is, is, is it justified? Yeah, but sure. So, um, you know, those kinds of improvements, I think are, are something separate, but when it's some, some, uh, op, it, when it is a definite placebo effect that's being observed, these, these are transient. This is, this is to do with kind of general subjective measures. So I was saying, you know, you have some things which are hard outcomes, but for things like breathlessness, mood, you know, a lot of the um, um, kind of modern snake oil salesmen are, um, well, and saleswomen, I, I, there's plenty of those <laughs> as well. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the target audience are people who... Nowadays, you know, a lot of it is there's a lot of talk of mental health, and if you if you look at the things modern medicine tackles badly, that is the hotbed for alternative medicine. Mm. And you know, the last few years, and I think it's probably a video I'm 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 may, maybe going to make soon is about long COVID. Mm. You know, long COVID is is uh, another field like chronic fatigue syndrome, and you know, probably they are related um, phenomena. Um, 
it is something that we medicine has, has tackled very, very badly. You know, we have no effective treatment for long COVID, chronic fatigue syndrome. We don't really understand what they are very, very well. Um, and so who will step into the void? It's the alternative medics, because uh, an evidence-based doctor can't say, look, I'm going to make your long COVID symptoms better. And I get a lot of long COVID patients with cardiovascular manifestations. And, I, you know, I feel like a lemon when I say, look, sorry, there's, there's, there's not much I can really offer here. Um, you know, I'll point them in different directions and do what I can. But ultimately, they're going to come away feeling dissatisfied that there's, there's nothing much that I'm, I'm doing for them. But an alternative medicine practitioner come along and say, this is going to help you, guaranteed, this is brilliant, you know, Gwyneth Paltrow making her bold promises or, you know, Joe Rogan on his, his, his podcast saying ice baths are going to change, change your life. Um, they don't have that sort of uncertainty with what they're saying. They give a very confident message. So the placebo effect for them will be much more powerful. But people have to be aware that if it's not some transient thing, if it is a, you know, a, a, a long-term medical condition, the placebo effect can't treat that. It is a temporary improvement. So that's why I don't get too upset if people are seeking out alternative medicine for kind of minor things, which are going to get better anyway. You know, like when people were um, uh, drinking cow urine for, uh, for COVID or something. Most people just get better from COVID uh, after a few days. They get it from a cold or whatever. But when you have a serious underlying disorder, the placebo effect cannot fix that. And anyone claiming just because of something in a trial, looking at a placebo having an effect, that, that, is, that is a temporary thing. It's not a cure. I think one thing you mentioned... Uh in one of your early answers is that you do all these theater to make sure the pa patient doesn't know they're getting a placebo treatment. But in that video that you did on the placebo effect, I, uh, you also talked about how knowing the, knowing that the, the patient knowing that they're getting a placebo can still have a placebo effect. So, uh, like, doesn't, I mean, uh, if that's true, then why do you need to uh, keep them blind mm. from uh, the fact that they're getting a placebo treatment? Yeah, so I think there are different things here. So in the trials where it's blinded, what we're trying to do is establish the efficacy of a, a, new, a treatment. So uh, as in a, a medical treat, a, a real medical treatment. So in that case, we want them to be blinded because we want to know exactly what the effect is. And so we don't want the patient having any knowledge of what they're receiving. The trials you're referring to are, are mostly from, from one group. Um, and there's a researcher called Ted Kapchuk at Harvard who, who's done a few of these trials. And I didn't know about these until I was making the video. Well, I'd heard kind of bits, but I hadn't really looked into it. Um, these honest placebos or open label placebos, uh, if you search on PubMed, that's what they're known as. And that is where, yeah, the patient is aware that they're getting a placebo and yet they still saw a benefit. And a few of these were in inflammatory bowel, um, sorry, irritable bowel, not inflammatory bowel, irritable bowel syndrome. And irritable bowel syndrome is another disorder that we don't manage very well. We're not entirely sure what the pathophysiology is. There's no organic abnormality that can be detected you know if you take a biopsy or something it'll it'll be normal but people have quite disordered bowel habits and they can get quite a lot of bloating and pain and so they found even with telling the patient they were receiving a, a placebo they still derived some benefit modest but you know they were still still present so what that tells me is that it, you know Again, I think it is partly they were in a trial, they were having a lot of care paid attention to them, they were having, you know, researchers calling them, checking them, you know, having, having sort of that attention, which I think is part of, you know, the, the, you know, the whole, the whole placebo of a consultation. And I th again, I think this is lends um, credibility, not credibility, but it lends power to the alternative medicine practitioners, mm. because think about a modern medical interaction in 
most countries these days, it's rushed. It's maybe very cold Literally and clinical. In India. Yeah, in India and in UK, you know, um, uh, America, they're, they're kind of overworked, understaffed medical facilities. They're maybe looking at a computer. They're not even looking at the patient. They're, they're, you know, it, it's, not, it's not a nice experience. You go to an alternative medicine practitioner, and of course you're paying more to do that, but they may be in a, a nice surrounding, they really listen to you, they pay attention, they maybe it's a one-hour consultation. Which one do you think is going to be better before you've even taken a tablet? Which, which one do you think the patients are going to enjoy more or, or get more value from? So I think in those open placebo trials, I think it, part of that was also sort of having that attention. Um, but there is a company that sells these honest placebos that, that they come in like a little medical looking bottle called Zebo, and, and, and they are sold as an honest placebo. Um, and it, you know, it kind of is bizarre, but people buy them and say they feel better, even knowing there's nothing in them. And it seems a bit odd, but I think a lot of us do it to an extent. It, you know, I, I had these um, uh, little energy uh, tablets when I was in school like they were basically literally just sugar. They were just, I mean, and I think now they'd be illegal to sell them to kids. They were just like concentrated sugar. And I believed that if I sucked one of these sugar tablets before my exam, I would just be like, you know, on fire. And I think I knew that there was nothing in there. But, you know, we, we I think a lot of us kid ourselves. Sports people do it with, with their lucky socks or superstitions and things like that. And there was a bleed over between superstition and, 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 and placebo. And I think, it, it's all about creating the optimum psychological milieu for, for you to be performing at your best. So some people will, um, you know, be able to, 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 to do that without a, a device, without a, something to, to focus their energy. But some people might find, you know, benefit from, from having a specific thing to like channel that through, even if they know it's not, not effective. So yeah, you know, it, it, yeah. Again, it is just very, very interesting. Um, I can't see many of these open label placebo trials being done. Uh, and you can tell, you know, there isn't much placebo research in general because there's not really much money in it. So who's going to be spending money to mm -hmm. research all this? But, um, but it, it's, yeah, it's really interesting to see how the human mind works. So uh, also, I, I'm very fascinated by the fact that sham trials are a thing. So uh, I'll ask you more on that. Um, why do you think or who do you, do you know who was the first person to think that, hey, we should cut a person open and not do anything or? Yeah, it was in the 19, 1960s. Okay. Um, and it was, again, uh, from cardiac stuff. So, you know, I know I sound like a supremacist here. We, we, we really, you know, lead the way. <laughs> in, in, in medicine, we've done all the biggest trials and, and uh, we did the first sham controlled trial, which was looking at the predecessor to bypass surgery, which was, um, again, you know, it's all about, I had a separate video about this thing called, which I've called the mechanistic bias. Uh, um, I, it's a term I've, I've coined myself. I don't know if there's a, a, a different uh, phrase for it, but this tendency that scientifically minded people have, we're more susceptible to actually than, than the layperson to believe in something which makes mechanistic sense. It's like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. That, that works. So we kind of leapfrog the evidence mm. and say, yeah, that, that sounds like it works. And this, we do this in medicine all the time, like in these procedures that, that have been disproven later on. So back in the 60s, well, the late 50s, um, patients with severe heart disease Somebody had the idea of disconnecting. Uh, we've got this kind of spare artery, which comes off the subclavian here, and it supplies the chest wall. And if you disconnect it, it doesn't really make any difference. The, the chest wall has got other blood supply. Oh. But then you can redirect the end of that artery to the heart. And indeed, that is the, the most important aspect of a bypass surgery to this day, is this artery. It's called the internal mammary artery. and now we connect it to the blood vessel in the heart. So it, that is the bypass. It bypasses the surge. Sorry, I brushed the mic. It bypasses the blockage and, and 
connects to the, the artery. That's a that bypass operation. Mm. But before that, somebody had the idea to just sort of attach it to the heart muscle, not to the artery itself, just to kind of bury it in the muscle and attach it there. Mm. That apparently, they, you know, that made mechanistic sense in those days. And they published a case series of, I can't remember how many it was now, it's a few months since I looked at this, but a small number of patients that all felt better after having had this surgery. And of course, think about cardiac surgery in the 1960s. It would have been an incredibly high risk, elaborate thing, huge team in the operating theater, you know, very primitive um, uh, equipment compared to today. So this was a huge deal. And these patients th were having world first kind of surgery and they came out, uh, yeah, you know, I have been operated on by the world leader. I'm one of the first people in the world to have this procedure. I feel so much better. Mm. And it was only later on, quite soon, it, it, was not, it was not that long after that other people were trying to replicate this and they were like, yeah, I'm not mm. entirely convinced here. So then the first CHAM surgery trial was done where they randomized into not doing this or, or doing it and found that there was no difference in outcome. Do you charge the patients the same whether or not uh, the actual procedure was done on them? Oh, they're, they're not paying anything. No, no, oh, it's no. a trial. It's a trial, yeah. Okay, okay. And even, even in my day-to-day -day practice, we don't, we don't charge anything in, in the UK. Everything is oh, it's, all, it's all free at the point of access. So let's say if uh, such a surgery, sham surgery, was done in the US. If you're in a trial, patients don't pay. They, they won't. So... All, all research, you know, is, is done outside of, of that. If, if you are volunteering to be in a trial, then your, your treatment is, is, is paid for. But if it's not a trial, if it's an actual procedure, mm. how would they uh, get a sham surgery done on them? Oh, they, they wouldn't. They wouldn't. You, they you wouldn't. can't. Yeah, you can't, can't do that. Oh. It, it can only, oh, it can only happen in, in as part of a trial. Otherwise, that's essentially... Assault, you know, if you if you're not if you're just cutting somebody open, not with the intention of treating them, that's that's just assaulting someone, isn't it? So, um, you know, uh, you've got to, it's got to be done with the intention of treatment. Sometimes okay. we'll do operations where you'll open someone and not do anything, but that's because it is deemed to be futile. That's called an open and close. So, if if someone has got cancer, you open them up, and it's just too severe, then you, you may just not do anything. But that's a very different scenario. Mm. So this clears up a lot of things for me. Uh, I was under the assumption that, uh, you know, it's something people can opt for. Or it's an actual procedure, not part of a trial. It's an actual surgery that gets done. The other day, we, uh, my wife bought me a head and neck massage guy to come to the house here in Bangalore and um, what's the, the op open and it's like this, this, you know, beauty treatment company, they come to your house and uh, do, do stuff. Urban so, company? Urban, yeah, urban company. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's the one, right? Um, not an ad. And um, <laughs> uh, he was giving me this, this kind of, and he like he was really going for it, right? I mean, he was like trying to crush my head. I was kind of enjoying it. And then I haven't had one of these before, right? so I didn't know what he was leading up to. And then he was doing like this stuff, and I was like, uh oh. And he went <laughs> like that. And, um, and oh, it was not good. And then he tried to do it in the other direction, and it, it didn't work. And that's basically chiropractic, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I've had a chiropractic adjustment now. And um, uh, I felt much worse than before. It wasn't the relaxing experience that I had hoped for. But um, but a lot of people will report feeling better after a chiropractic adjustment, mm. like just the same way, you know, cracking your knuckles feels nice, but it's transient. Mm. It's that's it. That's all it offers. It's a transient relief. Um, and so all of these treatments have no effective underlying, um, uh, 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 effect, but people will, will go and, and get some feel better out of doing them you know, through a combination of a bit of immediate relief from, say, uh, manual manipulation. And one of the things I talked about in the video is also just the, the, the physical contact, you know, the kind of mm, mm. caring, ten, tender mm, environment mm, mm. that people find 
enjoyable and that, that's that's human nature and i think we've been starved of that particularly in the pandemic um which you don't get in a medical appointment because that's not what medicine should be offering i don't think but i can fully understand why somebody will go for these kind of treatments because it, it feels nice um and i think we should be free to say things feel nice without trying to make out that they're some sort of incredible effective treatment um but uh it, it it leads some of my colleagues to say, I wish we could provide a placebo treatment on the on on the NHS in the UK, you know, as in within medical kind of practice, mm -hmm. because some patients may derive great benefit from those kind of things, and that's why they will find it much more helpful to go to uh, get a you know cu cupping or acupuncture or something like that rather than um you know a more conventional treatment because it offers that kind of sham surgery type thing so you can't go to a doctor and ask for a sham surgery mm. but you can go to an alternative medicine practitioner and they won't call it a sham surgery they'll say it's a very effective treatment and your energy is going to be channeled and we'll do this and that but uh, but that's what it is mm. so that's the way people access these kind of sham mm. sham treatments um and that's why I've got a, you know, I've, I've changed my opinion on a lot of these things in, in, in my years of practice. And I don't, I don't, you know, shout at people if they, if they want to do these things. I've got patients who get value from them. As long as they're doing something that isn't dangerous, that's not going to interfere with their mm. other treatment, and they're not rejecting evidence-based medicine to do them. You know, I'm, I'm pretty much, I'm quite a libertarian yeah. doctor. I just let people do what they want to do. I think um, in places or in uh, communities where people are sensible enough to uh, think that way and makes these kinds of conclusions, I would, maybe it's okay, yeah. but uh, uh, from what I've seen, uh, people, if you, uh, if you are okay with someone opting for alternative medicine or if you see someone and uh, you condone that kind of thought uh, of you know the same thought that leads to alternative medicine I think um, people who uh, think that way are way more prone to being scammed being uh, I know some fraud taking advantage of them so I think that has a very severe effect on their pockets, mm. their health. So uh, I, I'm not very sure if me personally, I would condone it so much. But yeah, I, I think you're very right. I think you've got to be, you know, I'm talking as someone living in mm. the UK. Um, and I think it is very different in different settings. Mm. Um, and I've seen that with friends and family here that... Um, you know, they, they will make very bad decisions. Mm. Um, and I think here in particular with, you know, Ayush mm. and the promotion of this stuff that allow homeopathic practitioners to, you know, prescribe medica normal medications and be recognized as equivalent, that's extremely misleading. Uh, and there's such a powerful home homeopathy lobby mm. uh, uh, here in India um, that I've been on the receiving end of, you know, they wrote to the General Medical Council in, in the UK. Um, to when you made that homeopathy is not effective video. Oh, I mean, that was just a tro <laughs> troll, you know, a short video, but um, that was more just to entertain myself. But, you know, when I, when I talked about the, it was actually on Twitter that, 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 yeah. that they got the, that I, I won their ire. Um, but yeah, you know, they wrote complaints to me about, about me to my regulatory body in the UK. They didn't, give, they didn't care, but um, uh, they are very aggressive. So if you're a practitioner working here, um, then I, I, I would, you know, totally understand the, the scare tactics that they use can be very, um, you know, career threatening. Um, so to the patient, to the public, they think that these two um medical um systems are equivalent mm. which is which is terrible and i don't i don't believe that that is the case very commonly in, in the west so yeah I, I i very much agree it is very 
audience specific mm. and 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 I I can see how the ramifications of of condoning that kind of thought process can can be worse in different settings. I think that's it. That's pretty much all the questions I had. Any uh, last thoughts you want to leave us with? Well, I I mean, I don't know who who your viewers are, but, um, you know, I think one of the things that I'm really, I'd love to see, I I really want you to inspire other people to start doing more science communication on YouTube. I I know that there are, you know, science communicators, journalists and and things like that in, in old media. But I am very much of the opinion that uh, TV is dying, except for, you know, scripted dramas. Um, And I'd love to see more uh, Indian science content, educational content. I know from interactions that there is an interest in in all this stuff. And, um, you know, it's been, when did Three Idiots come out? Ten years ago? Yeah. More than that. More than that, yeah. Like 2009 or something, right? I don't, don't know. know exactly when, but um, it must have been around. You know, that so time. like that, I think was a bit of a watershed with a lot of people to kind of really uh, show how bad the education system can be at 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 not feeding people's desire and 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 interest, but sort of stamping it out. Mm. And I don't know if much has changed. You know, I, I'm 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 hesitant to say anything too much because I'm not involved in 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 how it is here. But I know from a lot of emails I get. And um, uh, stuff like that, that that I think there are a lot of people fascinated by science who want to learn more about it outside of that academic setting. And India's, you know, it's a huge, huge market. Um, some of my American YouTube friends the other day stumbled on a Hindi channel, uh, which obviously they didn't understand, but they could see that it was about science. And the, each video is getting like a million views. and um, and I'll tell you afterwards. And then um, they were like, Rohan, like, how do I get my videos dubbed in Hindi? <laughs> and uh, so there's suddenly, you know, understanding. And I've been trying to say this for I'm like the only guy of an Indian origin in, in this little group that I'm in. Um, that there is a huge potential market out here. And yeah, it's very different. You know, the, the ad revenue is going to be very different to English market. But... A lot of my friends translate their videos into Spanish for the Spanish speaking market. So, um, you know, I, I, I would like to do this myself if I can. It, it, in, I, I'm not a full time YouTuber, but I'd, I'd love to do more, more stuff kind of with a Indian slant. And, uh, you know, maybe I think I'd be probably be a sort of crime against the Geneva Convention if I dub my own videos in Bengali. I think a lot of Bengalis will. <laughs> we'll we'll write in complaints. Maybe I'll get someone with a, a better and, and Hindi is it would just be a non-starter. That's uh, I can barely speak any. But um, uh, but yeah, I you know I I would I, I'm so you know uh, fond of 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 the kind of uh, uh, I, I I just love to see India more on the world stage when it comes to this kind of content. China, this is where we've got a big advantage over mm. China because mm. they're not on YouTube. So, you know, and they don't speak English anywhere near as uh, much as Indians do. So I think Indi- this is where India mm. can really, you know, try and be a, a big power when it comes to, to online kind of content that isn't the usual rubbish that we see coming out of Indian YouTube. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'd, li- I'd, I'd love, to, love to see that. And I hope you, you do inspire others. Yeah, I hope I do too. Uh, also, Rohan, I know I said that was the last question, but I just thought <laughs> okay, of no one way. more. And I think I should ask this because my audience will hate me if I don't ask you for a cardiology health tip. Uh, so in one sentence, if there's one advice you could give for better heart health, what would it be? Exercise. That's easy. That's an easy one. There's, you know, someone asked me, which is more important, diet or exercise the other day? Like if someone did no exercise, but had a healthy diet versus someone who exercised a lot, but ate junk, which is better. And I think, I mean, that's a slightly unrealistic question, but exercise, I think it's fair to say is not the most effective way to weight loss, but it, 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 if it was a tablet, 
it would just knock any other medication in the world mm. into the long grass because exercise offers so many benefits, not just cardiovascular health, but general health overall, mood, bone strength, diabetic risk, cancer risk. Exercise is, is this real wonder drug. Mm. Uh, but if I had to add one dietary tip, mm. then, you know, I think um, there's so much out there to confuse people about diet. And actually it can be pretty simple. You just avoid refined carbohydrates or sugar, just try and minimize your sugar intake. And I know there's an Indian audience here. And remember, I'm, this is, I'm a Bengali speaking here. So, so when I say avoid sweets, it's, uh, I know it's not a mean undertaking, um, but uh, that's gonna be your biggest kind of uh, thing to move the needle and sort of not too much ultra processed food. Um, and the rest don't, don't agonize over the rest. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you move as much as possible. Don't eat too many rasagulla and, uh, <laughs> and, and you'll be okay. Okay. And, uh, with that, we'll end it. Uh, MedLife prices, everyone. I link us channel below and yeah, Rohan, thanks for joining me on the Sciences Dope podcast. It's been really fun yeah it's been really it's see you been in great. your videos yeah hope so come to the uk sometime yeah i will hope everyone enjoyed that podcast as much as i enjoyed taking that interview i just like to remind everyone that all this content is produced with the help of direct support from my audience and if you'd like to support me to do the same like these wonderful people then you can find the links below you have options like patreon buy me coffee upi youtube memberships links can be found below i'll see you in the next one till then remember science is dope